I think we can we can safely get started. So thank you everybody for coming. So this session is uh, for postgraduates from Melbourne Uni, from UNSW, uh, from our own Wollongong and the University of Sydney. So four of our institutions represented. And our first speaker today, today is going to be Samara Greenwood, followed by Roberta Parler, mm -hmm. uh, Tatiana Anderson, and Rebecca Johnson. So I'll introduce each of them properly as they begin. Now, just uh, a reminder that you all have uh, roughly half an hour uh, for each of your um, each of your papers. And if you could try to keep it to 20 minutes, I'll let you go up to 25, but we, it would be good if we had just, you know, at least five minutes to uh, for some questions at the end. So to start with Samara's presentation, it's How Context Shapes Science, A Tale of Two Papers. And Samara is a PhD candidate in History and Philosophy of Science at Melbourne Uni. And her thesis explores the relationship between social context and scientific practice through a multiple case study analysis. Uh, she also writes for the University of Melbourne Research Blog Forum and is a registered architect. So Samara, when you're ready, please begin. Thank you very much. I will share my screen. Let me just get that. Okay, how's that? All right, so thank you uh, and welcome to my presentation on how context shapes science, a tale of two papers. My presentation is based on work from my PhD project in which I investigate the various ways science is shaped by its context. Today, I'll introduce you to a current framework, which I call the resources and constraints model of context. I'll then take you through a case study of science and context looking at the interactions between primatology and second wave feminism during the 1970s through the lens of two key papers. I use this case to illustrate some limitations of the resources and constraints framework and point the way towards a more multi-dimensional understanding of context. So the problem of context was perhaps most famously described by Peter Gellison in his 2008 paper. Gallison described how intellectual and cultural contexts are routinely invoked by HBS scholars to help explain particular episodes of science, but that the general framework for understanding this relationship is underdeveloped. He further highlighted two extant models, the causal model, where contexts are deemed to deterministically cause certain outcomes in science, which Gallison saw as too strong, and context as resources, on the other hand, where contexts are described as merely acting as a novel source of input for science, which he saw as too weak. Today, the causal model has largely disappeared from the literature. However, the resources model continues to be supported and further developed by several scholars, including Theodore Arabatsis, M. Norton Wise and John Schuster. While there are many nuances to these scholars' differing positions, the main thrust of the model is that scientists work within a constrained set of conditions, which Arabatsis calls a space of possibilities. However, within this constrained set, scientists are free to choose their own resources. We might imagine this like a supermarket of supplies, hence my image of the supermarket there, in which the scientist has not chosen the resources available, but can freely pick from within those constraints. This model is typically invoked in reaction to a causal understanding of context. However, these scholars go further to claim contexts do not influence or shape scientific work in any way. Rather, all the agency is suspected to be with the innovative individual. For example, Schuster emphatically states straight away that talk of influencing or shaping must go. Rather, it is the players who do the acting. They're not forced, imprinted, influenced, or caused to do anything by large-scale contextual features. Similarly, Wise states that he wants to see a model in which individuals are fully responsible for their choice of influences, or as he would prefer, resources. They contend the idea of contextual influence tends to relieve individuals of their autonomy and turn scientists into seemingly cultural dopes. However, in my work looking at multiple case studies through the history of science, such a simple dichotomy doesn't appear so clear cut. Rather, in most cases, both individual agency and contextual, 
influence appear to be in play, with individuals making choices within highly charged environments and varied environments that guide their decision making in various ways. While I look at a number of case studies in my PhD work, today I'm going to illustrate this point by taking us through one particular case. So as it's called, a tale of two papers, as I mentioned, it looks at an intriguing episode in science during the 1970s, focused on the USA. The science in this case is primatology and the key contextual resource slash influence is feminism. In particular, I focus on the first two key texts in primate studies known to have drawn on feminist concerns. The first is a 1973 magazine article by Jane Lancaster titled In Praise of the Achieving Female Monkey, which was published in Psychology Today. Now, this is a paper that's often referenced in passing in sort of histories of prim feminist primatology in particular, but there seems to be very little historical research on it. And I, I perhaps this is because it was done, it was published in a popular magazine. In contrast, the second one published just a year later, 19, the 1974 peer reviewed journal article by Jean Altman, Observational Study of Behaviour Sampling Methods, was published in the esteemed journal Behaviour and is far more well known and, and slightly more studied, but still understudied, I would suggest. Looking at more detail at these papers, just starting with Lancaster's paper, at the time of publication, Lancaster was a relatively early career researcher in both anthropology and primatology, having received her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in 1967, where Sherwood Washburn, who is considered the father of primatology in the US, was her supervisor. Lancaster had taken a lead role in student activism during her PhD studies, for example, acting as a liaison between Washburn and the teaching assistants and students during the, the well-known riots of 1964. And then she became involved in the subsequent women's liberation movement, which is seen as a bit of an offshoot of this development, which was geared towards consciousness raising among women about male bias and their secondary status in society of the day. In the magazine article, Lancaster's involvement across these three domains of activist feminism, anthropology and primatology are all evident. For example, she starts the uh, article by describing, describing the changing role of women in society at that time. For example, she mentions birth control and the population explosion and the a need for a new understanding of women coming specifically from science studies. She argues that in society at that point in time, there's a common belief that women aren't central members of society, but rather secondary to men. And that what she calls this folk belief infects anthropological work. She then moves from talking about the anthropological work to how further argue the primate studies show a similar bias towards males and stating, and here's a quote from the paper, Field studies of monkeys and apes have suffered from this overemphasis on the behaviour of adult males. They, these adult male primates, are often large and their behaviour conspicuous. Although they constitute only a small percentage of a primate society, they often receive more than their share of attention unless the observer uses careful sampling techniques. Now, this, the, uh, this is a veiled reference to the well-publicised work at this point in time of Irvin DeVore. So he'd earlier looked at observing baboon behaviour right at the start of a real burst of, of, of um, primate observational behaviour in the field. His work was on baboon behaviour in, in Kenya, um, starting in the 1959 and going through the early 60s. And after this, a relatively short period of observation, he boldly theorised that male baboon hierarchies form the glue of primate groups even extending this theory to suggest that all primate groups are bonded by this male hierarchy. In the article, Lancaster notes such dominating theories convey male primate social relations to be of prime importance, which in turn tends to relegate female relations as this sort of less critical secondary aspect to the cohesion of the primate group. Countering this dominant story, Lancaster notes that, and I quote, Recent primate studies indicate that earlier researchers may have concluded too much from insufficient data and that female primates have a far larger role. They, these new primates, these new primate studies, which includes um, Japanese studies being done at this time, suggest that it is the matrifocal core that provides a primate group with stability and continuity, while males 
on that con in contrast begin to roam at puberty. Later, after this kind of blew up to be more of a debate in the field, DeVore would defend himself, stating, I did the most obvious study, <clears throat> which was on male peck order. That's the thing that hits you when you first see baboons, the big rowdy males. When they move, things happen. They also had shifting coalitions, and this was so new that everyone seized on it as being of the utmost importance. While Lancaster's article was not peer reviewed or published in a mainstream scientific journal, it was apparently popular in certain circles. So Adrian Zillman, um, who later became a well-known primatologist and anthropologist, recalled that it was widely circulated amongst, particularly amongst young female anthropologists and primatologists at the time, particularly with these connections to feminism. In contrast, turning to Jean Altman's paper, Unlike Lancaster, Altman had no qualifications in either anthropology or primatology at this point in time. Rather, she was a young 31-year-old mother of one, and her academic training was in mathematics, a domain in which she'd faced continued challenges for being faint female. For example, she recalls that in her first year at UCLA in mathematics, Altman was told in no uncertain terms that the faculty had no interest in women majoring in mathematics because they were seen as a waste of time. She reports often feeling she wasn't welcome in pure mathematics, but did end up uh, moving to first to MIT and then to the University of California, Al University of Alberta in Canada to obtain her undergraduate degree. Uh, but she did find a more welcoming environment working in computer programming under the leadership of innovative female scholars, such as Beatrice Whiting at Harvard. Altman, though, was eventually drawn into primate studies through her husband's work. Stuart, her husband, had obtained a PhD at Harvard studying primates, where Altman guided him in how to develop more rigorous methods for analysing primate behaviour. Then in the mid-1960s, Altman undertook her own observational work of baboons alongside Stuart in Kenya, where their more rigorous methodology showed significant inconsistencies with DeVore's earlier work. So they were working on the same animals, the baboons, in the same location in Kenya. Like Lancaster, Altman's paper reflects her involvement across a number of domains, but a slightly different selection. In this case, it's mathematics, primatology, and feminism. However, it's also a very different publication. It's a peer-reviewed scientific journal article. It's geared not just about the feminism. Feminism is part of it, but it's much more about this getting more rigorous with behavioral observation. Uh, it was pitched as a guide for working scientists analyzing and recommending the best sampling methods to observe animal behavior more objectively. In the paper, Altman notes many scientists do not appear to use sampling methods at all. She'd done a, quite a large survey across a number of behavioral studies, not just in primate studies, but beyond in animal and human behavior indeed. And she, yet see, she argues this often leads to observer bias, where the scientist's focus is inconsistent, stating, in a very similar way to Lancaster, without some form of systematic sampling procedure, there appears to be no way to avoid the bias that results when the observer's attention is attracted by certain types of behavior or certain classes of individuals. Here we see this similar complaint about male behavior gaining disproportionately more attention, but now she's neutralized the terminology, not referring to males, but just to certain classes of individuals. In fact, in the paper itself, Altman uses the pronoun he to refer to the scientist throughout. However, she does so with this authoritative tone, guiding his decisions. For example, she says, should he repeatedly scan the group? Should he watch each individual in turn? In this paper, I shall provide guidelines for choosing. Interestingly, the only explicit mention of females, whether female scientists or female primates, in the paper was reserved for key examples. For example, um, Altman describes a re possible research question as, are males more aggressive than females? She then states that only through careful planning could scientists justifiably determine whether apparent differences between the sexes were real or perhaps due merely to biases in sampling. Years later, Altman described how her subtle inclusion of feminism in this work was motivated by an understanding of scientific norms. She understood that explicit reference to feminist ideas would be considered politically motivated rather than scientifically objective. And it was a problem she herself was in conflict about and grappled with in doing this work. 
She thus worked to ensure that the way she used these outside ideas met the scientific conventions of the time. I suggest in part by this use of scientific conventions, Altman was able to reduce resistance to her feminist inflected work. Combined with the appeal of this um, contending a mathematically more rigorous method, this helped propel her paper to success. And it was an enormous success. In contrast to Lancaster's paper, Altman found an enthusiastic audience across both non-feminist and feminist scientists, both within primatology, especially to start with, and then in behaviour studies more broadly. Since publication, the paper has enjoyed continued success. So here I show a graph from the citations from 1974 through to 2020. It now is, you know, almost up to 800 citations a year. As of last month, last time I looked at Google Scholar, uh, it was at over 17,000 citations and it obtained citation classic status in the 80s at some point. It's been widely celebrated as well as helping move primate field studies from descriptive natural history to qualitative scientific practice. And Altman herself reveals that the paper's use spread widely even before publication. So she gave conference presentations on it. She spread it around. She was often asked by students for help in how to be more methodological rigorous. And so she would send this paper out. She also looked for many um, referees to, to review her work prior to publication. She spent four years creating this paper. So looking within and beyond these two texts, we can see how both papers show strong links to contextual events both within and outside primate studies. In particular, both papers were in part responding to the dominance of ideas put forward by leading figures of US primatology. I've mentioned DeVore, but that's also has very much linked to his mentor, uh, Sherwood Washburn's ideas as well. Only a couple of years prior to these papers being published, Washburn's work in particular had begun to be challenged by ideas put forward by feminists, not in primatology, but in anthropology in particular. And I want to just briefly do this previous element because I think it really puts these two papers in position. So I'm going to take you to 1968 and the women's liberation movement has really taken off in universities around the US. One of which was central was Washburn's home, the University of California, Berkeley, which is also where Lancaster was from. This movement often involved groups of young women coming together to discuss male bias in society to become actively more politically conscious of these issues. In that same year, Washburn published an article, a very famous article on his theory of man the hunter, which he'd been developing for over a decade and producing, but this sort of crystallized the ideas. In his theory, his pet theory, hunting a male activity was key to understanding the evolutionary bonding of societies. This is what he saw as central. Uh, and he also drew and relied on that earlier work of his mentee, Irvin DeVore, where that idea that male dominance hierarchies are the glue of baboon society and primate society and link these two ideas. While, as Lancaster note, divergent results were being found by many others and were discussed freely within primate studies, still Washburn and DeVore's work maintained the centre ring, you could say, in the US at this time. Then what we see after this sort of these two parallel developments is we see a connection being drawn, interestingly enough, by a master's student of Sherwood Washburn, Sally Slocum. She brings these two strands together through working with a feminist discussion group over a series of months talking about these combined issues. She mentions other feminist anthropologists, Jane Kephart and Joan Roos, and the discussions they had and the ideas came out of them, which resulted in a 1970 address to the annual conference of the American Anthropological Association. The uh, title was Woman the Gatherer, Male Bias in Anthropology. And as far as I can tell, it was the first text to use feminist ideas to critique science uh, in the US. Like Lancaster's paper, it also circulated amongst interested students. Uh, Zillman recalls it being on blue ink dittoed paper and circulated amongst the students. And the paper, unlike the more subtle references of Lancaster and very much Altman, was much more explicit about its attack. Uh, Slocum says, in particular, the concept of man the hunter as developed by Sherwood Washburn is my focus. She goes on to argue that this framework centres the role of males to human development while sidelining females. She suggests what's needed is different questions to be asked. In particular, she highlights the question, 
What were the females doing while the males were hunting? Reflectively, she further notes, it was only possible for me to ask this question, to even think this question, after I had become politically conscious of myself as a woman. And so you see this explicit connection being made between the studies she's undertaking and this other work she's doing in this sort of parallel development. From this cross fertilization between feminism and anthropology, we can then see how Lancaster and Altman's work develops from this base. Uh, we see uh, Lancaster bringing this criticism from anthropology into primate studies, and then Altman bringing it into her work in, uh, in observing animal behaviour in this way, and by doing so, by sort of uh, combining it with sort of more scientific uh, ideas, brings it into mainstream primatology. And we can see how these, just these three actors, how their varied location within different contexts really help provide them with differing perspectives on the issues at hand that perhaps others not in a similar position would have not. Beyond these few practitioners, I also suggest we can gain some insight uh, into the general atmosphere within primatology during this period uh, from Donna Haraway, who interviewed a number of primatologists during the 1980s, which is a critical time because um, in the 1990s, there's a lot of pushback against this and we see a lot of people changing their tune. But in the mid 1980s, they were still very much uh, in tune with what, what had happened during the 70s. And so I think it's really interesting to see. She states that several women in my interviews in the mid 80s reported personal and cultural affirmation and legitimation for focusing scientifically on females from the atmosphere of feminism in their own societies. Perhaps even more interestingly, the men she interviewed also reported a growing sense of legitimation for taking females more seriously. And, they, and she's even able to identify where this is coming from. One, it's coming from the data and arguments of women scientific peers, like we see with Lancaster and Oldman. It's also just the general prominence of feminist ideas in the culture and the experience of direct friendships with women influenced by feminism, those conversations that they have with them. And together, these bring a rich brew of conversation about females during this period. Even Irvin DeVore admits that it did take pointed questions from women to reshape his thinking. So returning to how did context work in this case, I argue that in order to understand why Slocum, Lancaster and Altman wrote the papers they did, it's not enough to consider what contextual resources were happened to be available to them at the time. These students, did, these scientists did not make their decisions within a neutral space of possibilities. Rather, it was a dynamic landscape of charge conditions and they were engaged across multiple intellectual domains. Of course, I'm not suggesting the context of feminism forced these scientists to write these papers. Rather, like Schuster and Wise argue, as intelligent, well-educated and innovative thinkers who happen to be in a fairly privileged position, these scientists did actively adopt and adapt feminist resources to identify and solve a problem in their field. However, it is equally important to note feminism was not a passive resource, but an active force in their lives. With their intersection across feminism and science, they were able to see things that perhaps others could not. And the general prominence of feminism during this period helped legitimate their concerns and create a receptive audience for their work. The upshot is, to finish off, the resources and constraints model I suggest, while it is a useful starting point, it's incomplete. It tends to downplay the way science is located within a dynamic, evolving and shifting landscape in which science and its context overlap and interact and perhaps actively motivate particular shifts in science or scientific work. While individual agency is undoubtedly a crucial part of the story, I argue any full framework of context must take into account the power of socially shaped action, including the variety of contextual domains in which different scientists are involved and which come to play in their work. In order to develop this more sophisticated framework, I contend we must move beyond seeing context as either behaving causally or, on the other hand, constrained resources to develop a more multi-dimensional framework that accommodates these varied ways in which scientific work is indeed shaped and influenced by its changing contextual conditions. One that accounts for both broader patterns of historical experience as well as the unique significance of individual lives. Thank you, that's the end of my. Terrific. Thank you, Samara. Okay, look, I think what we might do, though, is continue with the speakers and then we'll 
and uh, then we'll go to questions at the end of the session. So our next speaker is Roberta Parler. Roberta is from UNSW. Her, the title of the talk is Politics in Vaccines. Roberta is a PhD candidate in Social Policy Research Centre at UNSW and her PhD project, project investigates vaccines as political material encounters. Uh, she's got a BA in Cultural Anthropology from the University of Siena in Italy and an MA in Cultural Studies from Sydney Uni uh, with a thesis on recent public debates about vaccines and immunisation policies in Australia. Her research interests include social studies of science, science, technology and society studies, philosophy of the body. Uh, she's originally from Sardinia and she's been living here in Australia for the past eight years. So when you're ready, Roberta, please begin. Okay, um, thank you so much, Adam, for the introduction. Um, and okay, so I'd like to first acknowledge that I'm joining you from the unceded land of the Gadjigal and Bejigal peoples. And um, so in this presentation, I thought I'd try to reflect on the path that sort of led me to these last stages of my PhD. Uh, and try to bring together the work that I've been doing in these last four years. Um, and putting together this presentation has been an interesting, uh, humbling process that makes me feel slightly exposed, but um, here it goes. So um, I started working on vaccines during my Master in Cultural Studies when I was looking at the anti-vaccination debate in Australia um, in reference to the um, no jab, no pay policy. And um, when I started looking at these biotechnologies, something uh, that got my attention early on was the fact that their controversies um, were sustained through time. So we have documented accounts of anti-vaccination claims and positions since the first immunization policies and the first vaccines. And obviously, the specifics of these debates would evolve and change through time, but um, back then at least it's something, I, I felt that there was something always sort of unresolved or problematic um, that was always there. And these controversies have only strengthened now through this pandemic and are often um, attributed to the politicization of vaccines. So the assumption that while science can be politicized, it is not in itself political and it should not be. Science should be kept separate from the messiness of the political. And despite everyone is now even more aware of the sociocultural complexities of vaccines, we have seen a reinvigorated sort of distinction and opposition between science and politics with attempts to talk about, you know, or try to talk about vaccines without making it a political issue. Um, and then the vaccine debates raise issues around uh, ideas of bodies, of danger, health, um, immunity, borders, um, social and individual interests. This is evident now, but it was also years ago when I was uh, looking at the anti-vaccination debate. Um, and um, it sort of felt a little bit overwhelming when I started realizing that in these debates, all these factors and issues were sort of emerging. And so I felt the need, I guess, to take a step back um, and go look at these substances. Where do they come from? Where, what are they made of? What exactly is a vaccine and why is it so controversial? Um, and that, that is sort of how I, I began my PhD project. So I started looking at the current scientific literature around vaccines and soon realized that these um, these are very uh, complex substances and that it is unclear what phenomenon exactly the word vaccines points to. Vaccines are biological preparations and that's um, you know the most straightforward definition we have but also fairly vague. Um, the composition of a vaccine differs depending on the infection being targeted, on the technology being utilized and on the type of vaccine that is going to be produced. Vaccines are created to protect from pathogens, but are also made from pathogens. Um, and even pathogens are quite ambiguous microorganisms that defy simple definitions. In fact, um, 
we know that not all bacteria or not all, vi all viruses are always pathogenic. So what does it mean to be pathogenic? Um, the antigen is that component of a pathogen that triggers the immune system and the production of antibodies. And that is probably the only constant component of a vaccine, but they are no, you know, antigens are not less ambiguous in their workings. Antigens do not always look the same. Um, they can be different in their composition. They can be proteins or polysaccharides, or they can be more, more than one. Actually, there are many for each pathogen. Um, some you know, should work, but somehow sometimes they remain silent, which means that they just um, don't trigger the immune response. And we don't, scientists don't exactly know why. They can also stimulate different immune responses. So um, the antigen that you will choose to, to produce a vaccine needs to be the ones that stimulates the immune response that you want. Um, so what vaccines are made of becomes a very uncertain issue, um, and which does not only depend on which pathogen they're trying to create immunity for, but also the factors on which this antigenicity, so this capacity to somehow trigger the immune response is established. Then there's the issue of the typology. Immunologists have to figure out what type of vaccine best fights a specific pathogen. And this typology refers to the ways um, in which the antigen is presented to the body. This will impact the immunological response the vaccine will elicit. Um, but the decision of, of which type of vaccine to produce is all, also depends on, on the technology available, on the money available in specific labs. And I could go on, um, but here I just wanted to explain that um, there is a form of indeterminacy and ambiguity around vaccines, and that is how I wanted to start, and, or where I started um, my exploration of vaccine matter. So immunologists and vaccinologists are the first ones to recognize these indeterminacies, and uh, you know, they establish them as problems that they need to solve, and their internal debates are often focused on how to deal with these complexities. Um, sometimes the answer is to broaden the perspective. So um, if uh, we want to understand exactly what a vaccine, uh, what immune response a vaccine produces, and we're looking only at one part of the immune, of the immune system, the, the proposal was also, might be to broaden the perspective and look at the whole immune system to figure out what, what's happening. Um, sometimes the answer is to add more variables. Um, you know, with epigenetics, uh, we know now that as new aspects previously unaccounted for, like stress or environmental conditions, could impact a person's immunological response to vaccines. And so the tendency has been to try and to add on all these new variables to figure out a way we can sort of manage them or make sense of them. Other times the answer has been um, technological or you know, of measurements. So um, scientists claiming that we need better technologies, better instruments, or maybe um, better coordination between engineers or um, computer scientists working with biologists to figure out a better strategy. Um, overall, in general, this ambiguity, the ambiguity of vaccines and the complexities of vaccines se um, seems to be simply temporary among scientists. Um, there will be a time soon when things will become clear um, and we will know exactly what vaccines are and what they do and how to control their relation to the immune system and we will even be able to personalize vaccines. But um, instead I wanted to bring a feminist perspective to this indeterminacy and where indeterminacy is not something that needs to be solved. Feminist science scholars have shown us that the material indeterminacies of science are linked to the relational interdependent and political nature of bodies. Objects, entities and phenomena are instantiated in and by material practices uh, and they are therefore situated and contingent. As Valentine and Sear write in their reflection on feminist STS contribution to policy work, 
to argue that apparently immutable material characteristics change in different networks of practice and that those practices may, may be made up of people, objects and words, is to argue that each of these are real, but the real is not the same as unchanging. So feminist science scholars have warned us against falling into easy biological determinisms. And they also have warned us against anti-scientific stances that reduce science to purely discursive constructions. Instead, um, epistemological claims, so how we know vaccines, are also ontological and material claims, what vaccines are and how vaccines become enacted which are then inevitably ethical and political configurations. As Karen Barad says, phenomena by which she means processes of relations and not the things are the primary ontological units. The world is an open process of mattering, a material indeterminacy, openness to multiple relations and realities. Being here is being through relations, through mutually constitutive entanglements. So with this feminist sensitivity in mind, I encountered vaccines and their intricacies again, and I tried to stay grounded in, this, in their materiality without mistaking it for autonomy or stability. What happens if we try, uh, if we, instead of trying to solve some of these complexities and look for stability, we acknowledge them as part of the relational and therefore situated ways in which vaccines exist. If matter is situated and relational, feminist science scholars tell us matter is political. It can be done differently. Different relations will enact different vaccines and way of understanding vaccines. Vaccines only exist through the relations they emerge from. This relational existence is inevitably a political claim because it recognizes the power and responsibility attached to the possibilities of shaping vaccines differently depending on how we decide to maintain these relations, how we decide who is part of this relation and who is left out, what to do with these relations. Do we nurture them? Uh, do we limit them? Do we control them? Do we sustain new, new ones instead? A feminist approach not only focuses on the relationality of matter, but more specifically pays attention to those bodies that have been left out of these relations, those bodies that that have been only allowed to react to these relations and not to participate in them. They're peripheral bodies, to use Elizabeth Wilson's words. So um, I started looking at the relations that vaccines are implicated in. And um, so the, the relations with nature, with non-human bodies, um, the relation with the immune system, the relation with communities of bodies through the concept of herd immunity. Uh, and each of these relations are the object of, of different chapter of my thesis. Um, and here I thought I would just tell of, of one of these relations between vaccines and the non-human bodies that emerge um, in, in the laboratory. So during my field work uh, in a laboratory of uh, vaccine research and development, I learned how a nanoparticle vaccine against influenza was assembled as a hybrid encounter of viral, bacterial, human and plant bodies. In the laboratory, vaccines emerge as encounters of their own. Their substance is not homogenous nor autonomous, but instead are cohesive enmeshments of multi-species bodies. This specific nanoparticle vaccine um, combined the, uh, the hemagglutinin protein uh, that worked as the antigen from the influenza virus, the ferritin protein that worked as the vaccine delivery technology, the E. coli bacterium used to grow and divide the hemagglutinin and ferritin gene at a faster pace. Then the human cell line where you add these genes for the purpose of humanizing the proteins that they will produce. And finally, a protein called lectin um, that comes from snowdrop plants. And it's used to purify the nanoparticle from the rest of the liquid. Um, and at this point, you know, the nanoparticle vaccine is, is ready. And then the vaccine gets tested on animal models. Um, in the development of this vaccine, viral, bacterial, human and plant bodies cooperate, stick to each other, reproduce, constantly transforming. They're also purified and separated, 
they rely on mechanisms of assemblage, of bringing together, but also of border making and separation. Vaccines emerge as processes of interaction and collective collaboration of multi-species bodies as kin to these multi-species encounters. These more than human encounters are delicate arrangements. They rely on a constant interdependence of species. So what would it mean to think of vaccines as fragile and situated multi-species collaborations? The delicate material relations of the lab forces to accept an inevitable humility of vaccine research. And it is with this humility that I propose to think of the material politics of vaccines as equally collaborative and sensitive. This interdependence can be you know, exploited um, reinforcing hierarchies of bodies to make sure that the ultimate beneficiary are human beings and among them those who can afford that benefit. Or this interdependence can be considered as a humble reminder of the mutuality of these relations, that vaccines as multi-species encounters are only another facet of how we stay in the world, inevitably a community. The multi-species interdependence reflects uh, an ind indebtedness that if taken seriously challenges heroic and human-centered framings of vaccines as one of the biggest medical successes and contribution to human health. It is hard to think of a greater debt the vaccine research and success owes than that toward the animal labor and death entangled with it. The use of animal models in vaccine research is based on a need to test vaccine safety before being administered to humans and to build evidence of their effectiveness. Um, by looking at how animal models respond to vaccines, scientists in theory acquire knowledge of how humans would respond. But part of this process consists of killing um, these animal models. They, they retrieve their immune cells and their organs and then the scientists uh, study them. And there is consensus among these scientists that the use of animal models is problematic and that the knowledge acquired from them is limited and ambiguous. But as one of the immunologists I talked to said, it's simply the only thing that we can do for now. With its use of animal models, vaccine research contributes to shaping vaccines as fragile multi-species technologies that build their safety and effectiveness on other species labor and the precarious knowledge that they afford. There are important political stakes behind this acknowledgement, behind the understanding that the protection gained through vaccination is owed to these actors. And I want to reflect on the uncomfortable condition of staying with the trouble, as Haraway says, of building human protection through the systematic death of, an, of uh, laboratory animals to take responsibility in these multi-species enmeshments between human life and animal death means to embrace the obligation to stay with these troubled practices and even, uh, even when it is uncomfortable. As we highlight the heroic and life-affirming roles of, vac of vaccines, we leave no room to acknowledge the deaths that um, they are entangled with. We leave no room to mourn. As feminist sociologists uh, Murray and Steinberg explain, mourning is a way to reimagine our relationships, our being in the world. Mourning deals with the transformative dimensions of a loss. It is neither repudiatory nor affirmational. It is a communal practice, not simply a human process, but an ecological one. It maintains connections between species, between those who are still alive and those who are not. Mourning takes these deaths be beyond the borders of the lab and in our everyday lives. So vaccines emerge as kin to multiple and more than human multi-species encounters. They undo bodily barriers between human and non-human bodies, bind human life to animal death, rely on symbiotic and situated relations. Vaccines are constructed in their indebtedness to non-human actors by the human practices of the laboratory. For this reason, we remain constantly interpolated by these vaccines encounters and obligated, as Haraway says, to stay with this embodied, uh, embodied trouble. Vaccine research through this interdependence is not heroic nor grandiose, but it is precious. It is indebted. It is deathly and still vital. But to mourn the deaths of the animal models means to live through 
this responsibility um, as the ability to respond to multi-species encounters and to remember our own participation in them. The more I delved into vaccines matter, the more political vaccines seem to be. Uh, instead of something to avoid or something to neatly separate from the science, the political nature of these materialities is productive. It helps us deal with their indeterminacies, not as problems that can be solved through time and better science. But to think of these indeterminacies are due to the political call the vaccine make and that forces us to recognize that we are interpolated by these practices. Karen Barad reminds us that the entanglement of matter and meaning is both world-making but also world-excluding. Alternative worlds remain excluded. In a world where we insist on the fact that vaccines should remain separate from politics, where the vaccines are simply heroic human successes, we are excluding other worlds in which vaccines working is already political and when we take on the role of participating in these politics. Vaccines are not neutral substances that have been politicized, but they are themselves political. This political nature emerges from the relations they participate in as matter in the world. These relations are fragile, situated, ecological and collaborative. So my, my thesis ultimately asks how this reframing of vaccines could change how vaccines are done in the lab or how bodies materially collaborate, how safety and protection could be differently enacted. What would it mean to think of vaccines interventions and politics as forms of multi-species communities as depending on how the relations among these communities are sustained? What would it mean to consider vaccines immunity and the policies that legislate it as something humbling or fragile, as an operating effort and responsibility to enact communities and protection. So these are some of the questions that, um, you know, my perspective or, or the thesis is trying to open up. And um, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Terrific, thank you, Roberta. All right. Well, again, we're going to leave the questions until the end of the session. So our next speaker is Tatiana Anderson. And Tatiana is doing a PhD at Wollongong, and the title of her paper is Assetization in the Life Sciences, a Critical Political Economy of Military Biosciences in the United States. Um, uh, she is working in a transdisciplinary space, exploring the political economy of the biosciences, focusing on complex entanglements between finance, knowledge, ownership, capital accumulation, and techno-scientific research, which is trying to bring together work in political economy with STS. So Tatiana, when you're ready, please begin. There we go, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, can you all see my slides okay? Yeah, all right, cool, awesome. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Tatiana Anderson. I'm a PhD candidate, uh, as uh, uh, Adam said. I am joining you today from unceded Darawal country on the lands of the Wadi Wadi people. And my topic is on assetization in the life sciences um, with a special focus on the intersection between military, uh, the US military and biomedical research. So as um, actually links very nicely with uh, Roberto's topic, it's all about entanglements and enmeshments today. So my aim is to make visible some of the deep entanglements um, that entrench an extractive and dysfunctional innovation ecosystem in the biopharmaceutical sector, and to show how these entanglements calcify inequities in global access to healthcare, and in particular to therapeutics. But in order to narrow it down, I'll also be focusing on COVID-19 vaccines and a little bit on operational warp speed which was led by the United States in 2020. The core argument that I'm presenting today is that the current inequity in global access to vaccines is the result of a complex enmeshment between war biomedical logics, asset accumulation, accumulation logics, and intellectual property logics. 
So, uh, you know, for those of you that um, might not have too much of a background on this, I just wanted to give a little bit of context on Operation Warp Speed. So Operation Warp Speed uh, was a colossal US public private partnership designed to accelerate research, development, testing and evaluation for COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics. It was pitched to the Trump White House in April 2020. And as of 2021, it had spent about $18 billion on a range of uh, companies in the private sector, not just for for uh, COVID-19 vaccines, but also for therapeutics, diagnostics, and not just for vaccine research, but also for parallel manufacturing capabilities and also advanced purchasing agreements. The US Department of Defense was actually a key pillar, uh, not only in its leadership structure, but also in its mandate. So it was tasked with handling diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, production, and distribution. And um, Operation Warp Speed actually funded some of the top uh, COVID-19 vaccine manufacturers and researchers that have become uh, sort of household names, you know, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, BioNTech, uh, Novavax, and also Sanofi, GSK, and Merck, which uh, were funded, but they didn't end up uh, resulting in successful vaccines. What's interesting is the, that the groundwork for Operation Warp Speed was actually laid down decades earlier uh, through extensive public funding, um, not just from the US Department of Defense, but also from the US government more broadly for different but on also adjacent viruses uh, through SARS, MERS, Ebola, Hepatitis B, um, Dengue and uh, HPV. So, this groundwork and that little context on Operation Warp Speed uh, brings me to the first entanglement that I want to talk about, which is war biomedical logics. So the US Department of Defense is actually now among the world's largest investors in regenerative medicine and vaccine technology. And as Jennifer Terry explores in a brilliant book called Attachments to War, I highly recommend it. Uh, war biomedical logics are actually used to justify the continued expansion of the US um, DOD, the Department of Defense, its bureaucratic reach, uh, extended uh, you know, international presence, and its ballooning budgets. But I want to take Terry's claim uh, and sort of take it forward one more step uh, to argue that war biomedical logics are actually used to preserve the ontological security of the US and of the U Department of Defense more specifically. So in international relations, ontological security refers to how states construct self-reflexive autobiographical narratives to create a consistent identity, not just domestically, but also towards the international community in, the me in their membership as part of a global community of states. And my argument is that war biomedical entanglements actually provide the US with a self-appointed mandate as an indispensable leader in global health security as part of the ontological security of its identity. So the pivot to biosecurity, biosurveillance, um, bioterrorism countermeasures, particularly after 9-11, uh, created a, a context where the state can never have too much security or too much health. And this essentially creates an interminable project uh, that has no temporal or territorial limits because the health of populations, both domestically and globally, become enmeshed with the reach of the United States um, defense and security apparatus. And there's an obvious, at least in, in, in my opinion, and also as Terry points out, um, colonial and imperial project embedded in this. But I also wanted to highlight another key issue uh, that comes from war biomedical um, entanglements. And it's the fact that we need to interrogate the very agencies or departments from which public funding comes in. Whenever we talk about public funding for science and particularly through COVID-19 vaccines or biomedical research, we tend to treat public funding or government funding as a bit of a monolith. And I actually think it's quite important to, um, uh, sorry. Sorry, it's lagging just a little bit. Um, I think it's quite important to uh, illustrate how these government agencies and departments uh, or ministries end up actually infusing some of their bureaucratic and administrative particularities into the innovation process itself. So this translates not only into, you know, which diseases or conditions or therapeutic pathways gets, get funding, but also when we talk about um, uh, defense or security imperatives, we're talking about cloaking the innovation process in added layers of secrecy, diminished transparency, diminished disclosure, not just on the research process itself, but 
also on the very political economy of the resulting um, innovations. So there's extra secrecy and um, limited disclosure on negotiations on prices, on accessibility, technology transfer, intellectual property, and so on. And we've seen those come to the fore quite a bit with rather secretive uh, bilateral uh, licensing agreements between countries and uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine manufacturers and not exactly knowing what the liabilities are, what the prices are, um, all of that is uh, cloaked in quite a bit of secrecy. And if you add defense or security imperatives to that, it adds further layers um, that can make, uh, I guess, transparent democratic accountability quite difficult. So what I wanted to do was to also highlight how these public-private partnerships like Operation Warp Speed are actually occurring in a very dysfunctional and extractive innovation ecosystem. So in order to uh, give you a little bit more empirical quantitative data, I wanted to bring forward uh, the actual primary research area for, for my PhD, which is looking at uh, government's grant, sorry, contracts granted by the US um, Department of Defense for uh, research and development in the life sciences. So this is a, some preliminary findings from a pilot study of 429 contracts. Uh, there's hundreds of thousands of contracts. So this is actually comparatively a very small sample size, but the total amount that I looked at was about 2.7 billion uh, US dollars. And what I found was that 65% of all the dollars obligated, so about 1.7 billion, were awarded to companies that were listed in the stock market or companies that were subsidiaries of other companies that were listed in the stock market. So this is emblematic of the privatization of publicly funded research because the majority of dollars obligated actually end up going to companies which privatize research fundings, uh, findings and use them to increase their market capitalization, maximize value for shareholders, and to do so at the expense of equitable access to publicly funded therapeutics. So this brings me to the second logic, which is asset accumulation logics. And traditionally, when particularly in SCS, when looking at the political economy of the biosciences, the focus has been on commodification and on the process of transforming biological matter or you know biological products into commodities uh, through you know a system of production and labor. But I actually come at it from a, a complementary perspective, not a competing, I think, but perhaps a more complementary one, which is looking at the process of assetization. So starting from the asset form rather than the commodity form. Um, so commodities are essentially intended to be bought and sold on the market, right? So there are products, for example, like a vaccine that are intended to be bought and sold and the value is supposed to be realized at the point of sale. Assets, on the other hand, are intended to generate income via rent for a given period of time uh, by strategically managing their ownership and their monopolized exclusion. So commodification is necessary for capital accumulation in the sector, but it's insufficient for maximizing capital accumulation in the sector. Assets are actually the ideal vehicle here, and we understand assets as usually intangible income generating assets like intellectual property rights, instead of the actual vaccine as a product as a commodity. Um, so they are the ideal vehicle for maximizing differential accumulation, but the promise uh, in order to fulfill their promise, they actually must be legally encoded with four key attributes. The first one is priority over other financial instruments. The second one is uh, durability over time, so trying to extend the, the life and the income generating capacity of the asset for as long as possible. The third one is universality across domestic and international borders. So here we're talking about domestic and international patent protection regimes. And the fourth one is convertibility so that asset holders can actually lock in past gains by exchanging their assets in market exchanges. So that's a fancy way of saying similar to how if you bought a house, uh, you might decide to sell it uh, because the, uh, you know, the cash in hand that you get from that market exchange is more valuable to you than perhaps what you might expect to get in future rent from your management of that house for an extra 10 years or something like that. So my core claim here is that techno-scientific knowledge is transformed into an income generating asset through intellectual property rights, which are protected by the state domestically and by trade agreements um, and international organizations, for example, through the World Trade Organization, uh, the, the TRIPS agreement, the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights agreement from 1995, as well as bilateral and plurilateral trade agreements between countries and uh, licensing agreements between countries and companies like we've seen with COVID-19. And I also take this 
one step further, and it's to argue that assetization is actually guided by a logic of differential accumulation, um, where firms seek to capitalize on expected future earnings um, to beat average rates of return. So it's not just about accumulating per se, but it's about accumulating differentially. So beating average rates of return comparable to other peers or other dominant firms in the sector. So dominant firms, uh, which you know, you might think of as big pharma, I'm not a big fan of that term, but you know, that's so you get an idea of roughly the kinds of firms that I'm talking about. They own claims on techno scientific knowledge as an income generating asset. And those claims actually translate to corporate ownership over the pace, trajectory, and accessibility of therapeutic innovations. So given that dominant owners of techno scientific knowledge are firms that are listed in the stock market right so they're publicly listed firms it's important to pay attention to the financial strategies that they employ to maximize their accumulation there are many strategies of differential accumulation in the in the financial sector particularly with biopharmaceutical companies but i want to quickly touch on two key strategies which are mergers and acquisitions and share buybacks so mergers and acquisitions are accumulation strategies intended to tame limit and control overall market efficiency um, and while they maximize accumulation by transferring asset ownership to more dominant firms right so that's the market concentration and the sort of quasi oligopoly that we start seeing um, in in techno scientific capitalism there's evidence that they actually this doesn't necessarily translate to higher innovation outputs or uh, lower therapeutic prices so what we're seeing is the maximizing of differential accumulation in the sector with no corresponding uh, improvement in uh, therapeutic output innovation or therapeutic prices so we saw this with Sanofi and GSK, for example, uh, which received billions of dollars from Operation Warp Speed for an mRNA vaccine candidate. And in August this year, Sanofi uh, used its very strong financial position to acquire two other uh, leading biotechnology companies that were working on mRNA vaccines. And then literally a month later, after this uh, acquisition, Sanofi just announced that they would terminate their uh, COVID-19 vaccine candidate because of market saturation from Pfizer and Moderna, and they would pivot to work on something else. So this is companies literally using their strong financial position, which they get in part by privatizing publicly funded research and using that strong financial position to acquire the, the science of competitors uh, and to absorb their product and research pipelines as a form of um, what we might call Babylonian sabotage but also amalgamation and concentration of uh, biomedical assets. The second strategy is uh, share buybacks. So buybacks are another differential accumulation strategy where firms repurchase their own shares to drive up the price of the remaining stock, usually leading to a higher market capitalization, market valuation, and usually translating to um, higher dividends for shareholders and stock compensated executives. So from 2016 to 2020, we actually uh, found quite recently through a US congressional report that the top 14 by pharmaceutical companies spent around 219 billion in share buybacks and 335 uh, sorry, uh, 358 billion in dividends, uh, which combined actually outstripped their research uh, and development expenditure by about 56 uh, billion dollars. So again, more indication that um, higher market capitalization or differential accumulation in the sector does not necessarily translate to higher spending in, in uh, innovation and research and development and so on. And in the context of COVID-19, we actually saw this with Moderna, which was authorized by its board of directors to spend $1 billion in buybacks in 2021, despite having received you know, close to $10 billion um, in funding from the US government, uh, including $6 billion from Operation Warp Speed. So here we see companies that are uh, privatizing publicly funded research, they're receiving billions of dollars in public funds, and they're taking some of that money and actually spending it in increasing their own um, differential accumulation and maximizing shareholder value. Value. So we can see therapeutic innovation and public access or equitable public access being eclipsed by a logic of differential accumulation, which prioritizes short term financial gains for shareholders uh, relying on the ownership of intangible income generating assets uh, to massage firm valuation and absorb competitors assets. And this logic actually ends up justifying uh, high prices, high sector concentration, strong IPR protection, or what we might call the maximalist position on intellectual property rights, 
uh, short-term shareholder uh, gains over research and development expenditure and the privatization of publicly funded research. And similar to the autobiographical narrative of the US Department of Defense, the biopharmaceutical sector also disperses its own narratives which make uh, biopharmaceutical innovation or biomedical innovation and progress uh, in general, um, they make it contingent on the preservation of their differential accumulation. So the threat is that if you were to threaten any kind of profits or differential accumulation in the sector, you would essentially be threatening uh, biopharmaceutical innovation in the future. And we've seen companies threaten this um, in their opposition to TRIPS waivers uh, and waivers of intellectual property rights. So lastly, uh, in this end, I wanted to really quickly uh, look a little bit more deeply into the intellectual property logics and how they're more entangled with the assets. So biomedical asset ownership actually bestows uh, IPR holders, so intellectual property rights holders, with governance functions over prices and supply and distribution, not only of the inventions themselves, but also of their downstream applications. So dominant firms actually exercise power of corporate governance to continuously expand the differentiating potential of their assets over time, that's durability, and also to expand them over like in place through universality. So it's about consistently expanding the length uh, of patent protections and also the amount of, of countries or jurisdictions through which they can get the strongest possible protection, usually trying to go above and beyond uh, TRIPS and, and WTO stipulations. So um, I, international, sorry, intellectual property rights regimes, IPR regimes, they actually create monopolies over innovations only to release them to the public once they have lost their differentiating potential. And the expectation of when assets lose their differentiating potential is actually pretty much dependent on market expectations. So this is where the expectations of future earnings or the expectations of future value come into play because the, the project ends up becoming one of continuously expanding or lengthening that expectation of when the asset is gonna lose its differentiating potential and to try to extend that for as long as possible um, in time. So expanding the boundaries of durability and universality becomes an interminable and incomplete project because the logic of differential accumulation is in itself inter interminable. It just does not abide a limit. So uh, the sector engages in this interminable project by constantly seeking lengthier and more universal intellectual property rights protections, like I said, bypassing WTO and TRIPS um, uh, sort of stipulations by engaging in bilateral and pl plurilateral um, trade agreements, uh, strengthening and also in, in voluntary licensing agreements. And this is actually very similar to the uh, war biomedical logics where the same, the prospect of bi global biosecurity has no territorial or temporal limit, the protection of intellectual property rights in order to maximize differential accumulation also does not abide a temporal or territorial limit. And what I argue is that the current uh, north-south divide in access to vaccine uh, healthcare is not an anomaly, but essentially a norm and, or a foundational pillar in how this entire architecture uh, has been built, particularly through the international uh, part of the intellectual property rights regime. So the, the current debate surrounding the TRIPS waiver for COVID-19 uh, vaccines and therapeutics is an excellent example of this. So a TRIPS waiver would actually be a very efficient tool for uh, I guess, getting anywhere close to global vaccine equity precisely because it would disrupt biomedical assets uh, income generating capacity. So it would particularly uh, disrupt their durability because it would uh, sort of the uh, assets would be released to the public before they lost their mark, their differentiating potential according to the market. Uh, it would disrupt their universality and it would also threaten their convertibility because it would lead to asset devaluation. So it would essentially lower the value of those biomedical assets way below what the market expected. Um, and we know that waivers, uh, waiver patents and trade secret pa uh, sorry, waivers for patents and trade secrets are necessary, but they're actually insufficient. So we understand that 
an expansion of manufacturing capabilities, generic market entry, uh, and broader supply chains and infrastructure would actually be needed. What I argue here is that the legal uncertainty and the stasis surrounding a TRIPS waiver and surrounding broader flexibilities for patents or intellectual property rights create very difficult conditions for generic market entry, for infrastructure and manufacturing investment, uh, and they contribute to chronically low uh, generic or manufacturing and infrastructure capabilities in the global south. And that the bio biopharmaceutical sector capitalizes on the stasis and uncertainty as a form of sabotage, where accumulation is actually facilitated by the strategic management of industrial inefficiency in the sector, particularly by enforcing um, industrial inefficiency in the global south. So the sabotage prevents global, uh, countries in the global south from scaling up manufacturing capabilities in their supply chain infrastructure, not just for COVID-19 vaccines or therapeutics, but also in the future, because that we can expect that manufacturing capability to remain sort of long to medium term in the least, and they could be repurposed for other therapeutics. So the risk is that a TRIPS waiver will actually create a precedent that threatens biomedical assets, universality, and durability, while simultaneously facilitating the permanent expansion, or at least a long-term expansion, of manufacturing and genetic um, market capability in the global south beyond COVID-19 vaccines. But a lot of the uh, arguments around this have focused on how the sector is opposing this because of the threat of loss of sales revenue from COVID-19 vaccines and so on. What I argue is that yes, the loss of sales revenue is, is, a, is a particular factor, but the biggest risk for the sector with a TRIPS waiver is actually the way that it would threaten their assets, legal attributes, and in particular their durability, universality, and convertibility. So the primary consideration is actually how a TRIPS waiver would be the potential for widespread asset devaluation, not just of actual COVID-19 related biomedical assets, but any existing or future assets, because they would be, the sector would have uncertainty as to how long they can expect their assets to have that differentiating potential, which they've been banking on expanding and expanding continuously. So the most threatening risk is not the loss of sales revenue from increased manufacturing competition, but how these developments would actually threaten market expectations of future accumulation from biomedical assets, durability, universality, and convertibility value. So again, trying to place uh, the process of acetization at the center um, instead of, of sort of hyper-focusing perhaps too much on the commodity form. Not because it doesn't deserve research, but because it's very interesting to actually look at the asset as well as the commodity. And uh, lastly, I just wanted to uh, leave you with a quote from Terry, which I want to take as a, as a, a point of departure to highlight the three entanglements. So, Terry argued that uh, in relation to war biomedical logics, that in this anticipatory mindset, the future invades the present and takes it hostage by predicting risks and speculating on novel drugs. So I actually want to extend that further to highlight the broader entanglement with asset accumulation and intellectual property rights. So in a way, the, the present is taken hostage by the imperatives of differential accumulation that prioritize the expected future earnings from income generating assets uh, in the future over the lives and health of human beings in the present. And this creates a polarized asymmetry between the health and needs of the public today and the potential for private accumulation in the future. And this is codified in the very legal architecture that, that governs global healthcare access. And the entanglement and the resulting inequities are justified through legitimatory narratives that take the person hostage. So for example, the US uh, narrative of ontological security where you know, the world is dependent on the ever expanding reach of the US DOD for global biosecurity and also where the biopharmaceutical sector uses an autobiographical narrative where the world is dependent on the continuous expansion of its profits in order to benefit from biomedical innovation in the present and in the future. There's a tacit threat that dismantling the war biomedical nexus will result in greater, greater global biological insecurity and that any disruption to the legal codification of techno-scientific knowledge as an income generating asset will result in a standstill of biomedical innovation. And my final argument is that we, yes, we can make cosmetic tweaks or adaptations to perhaps a TRIPS waiver and so on in relation to COVID-19 or get a bit more government funding for research in the future. But unless we disentangle uh, these three uh, core logics, we will continue to see uh, global inequity in, in access to healthcare 
uh, particularly as long as these narratives continue to justify the very extractive and dysfunctional ecosystem that we have with biopharmaceutical innovation. Um, and then I have some uh, just citations, so you know I did my research. Uh, that's quite selective. I, I think I have probably have a lot more than this. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I can probably leave it there. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Tatiana. All right. So now we have our final speaker, who is Rebecca Johnson. And Rebecca is from the University of Sydney, and the title of her paper today is The Ghost in the Machine, has an American accent, challenging US-centric values in AI models with culturally and linguistically diverse texts. Uh, and she is a PhD candidate in the Tech Ethics program at the University of Sydney. Uh, and she is a founder and chair of PhD students in AI ethics. She's listed on the 2019 and 2020 100 Brilliant Women in AI Ethics by Lighthouse 3 in San Francisco. And she was co host of the first Women in AI Ethics APEC Summit in 2020. She's also a member of OpenAI, Closed GPT 3, and APEC Ambassador for MD4SG, which stands for Mechanism Design. For social good. So thank you, Rebecca, and please begin when you're ready. Thank you. Um, can you see just my one slide there? Is that coming through okay? Great, excellent. Okay, well, thank you for that great introduction. Um, as you heard, my name is Rebecca Johnson, but you can just call me back. I'm a PhD candidate at Sydney. And the topic I'm talking to you today about is the Boston machine has an American accent, challenging US centric values and AI models with culturally and linguistically diverse texts. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking to you from today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, the next important point of call before I start is that I'm presenting to you, um, not my page, it's part of my PhD work, but it's actually a collaborative piece of work with these other PhD candidates and one recent PhD graduate that I met through the group uh, PhD Students in AI Ethics. And I really want to highlight this because it speaks to the diversity of our authorship group, which is fundamental to the work that is done that I'm going to present to you today. Uh, as you can see, they come from a range of countries and also studying quite a, quite a lot of different countries. I think some of them are online today and they'll be available during the Q&A to, to answer some of your questions as well. Alrighty, so the agenda is I'm going to look at the AI model that we studied, some of the problems with the model, a uh, brief overview of co construction of language and value pluralism. Most of you are philosophers, so won't, get, won't need to get into too much depth with that. Uh, some of our aims and questions, research questions, our methods, and then a little bit of a discussion of results in our summary. So the AI model that we studied was called GPT 3, and GPT stands for a generated pre trained, pre -trained transformer. Uh, it was developed by a company called OpenAI, which was originally founded by Elon Musk and has a healthy share owned by Microsoft these days. It's a large language model driven by a type of deep learning called AI transformer architecture. And when it was launched in mid-2020, it was the largest AI model in the world and cost US $12 million just for the single training pass in addition to the development costs. Uh, the training data included a lightly filtered version of the internet, as well as several large book repositories and English language Wikipedia. It's a task agnostic AI, which means it can perform many tasks giving few or zero examples, often called shots. So what does GPT-3 look like? Just kidding, it doesn't look like help. So that's a really important point though, and it's part of, you know, a key part of our research is that GPT-3 is not artificial general intelligence, despite a little bit of the hype at the, at the beginning. Though its performance in text generation has led people to speculate that this is maybe the beginning of a strong step in towards the direction of AGI. But it's important to always remember through all this, through the talk I'm gonna give you here today, is that GPT-3 is stochastic. It works on probabilities and weights. It's not conscious, it doesn't think anything, and it just reproduces what humans think and believe by looking for patterns in the training data. 
So this diagram here on the left is a little bit more of a clearer picture of what GPT looks like under the hood. Um, the, this diagram is from the first Transformer AI paper, which was released by Google in 2017. Don't worry about the specifics of the diagram. The point is that it's a computer model that, that uses stochastic mechanisms. So Transformer AI technology has facilitated advances in how a model can draw context between words and amongst corpuses of text. Previously, one of the biggest problems in language models was drift, or sometimes called the vanishing gradient problem. So drift made it difficult for uh, older AI models to maintain context across multiple sentences when performing their task. The attention mechanism in Transformer AI uses mathematical modeling to provide estimated weights of how strongly words are connected in a section of text. So these things that you see on the screen here, which are easy for humans, are really difficult for older AI models. And that's what attention mechanism in Transformer AI has addressed. So for instance, if we have a look at the first sentence there, I poured wine from the bottle into the glass until it was full. We know that it is the glass. I poured wine from the bottle into the glass until it was empty. We know that they're talking about the bottle. Another really simple example of context that humans are really good at is the ship set sail on the 10th of April 1910. It sank five days later. We know that it is the ship. So these are just really small examples, but this is um, this development in technology has enabled a much broader reach of context of different words. This is what uh, GPT-3 looks like to the average user. So you've got this uh, API playground, and on the right there, you can see a whole bunch of settings. You just think of them as like dials and switches to kind of adjust to try and get the best output. And then uh, up at the top there, it says chat, then you have these uh, predefined templates that OpenAI gives you, and then you can also create your own. And then, so for instance, in this example, I have taken a chat template and I've modified the prompt or, or the, the few shot, as we call it, and that's what's in bold. So I've told, I've given GPT-3 a particular standpoint, I've told it that it was a professor of philosophy, and I've set up this question and answer kind of format. Here is just um, something that GPT-3 came up with today, and we can get stuck talking to GPT-3 for hours. Um, and sometimes it comes up with really great stuff, and the, and the text generation is really surprisingly great, which is what led OpenAI to keep closed access for the first year and a bit. And sometimes it just comes out with, you know, just random ranting, because again, it, you know, it is stochastic, and it is reflecting patterns that it's seeing in its training data. Okay, so as fantastic as these new AI technologies are, they're not without their problems. So one of the biggest problems with large language models, or LLMs, so I'll call them for the rest of the talk, are poor value alignment with the users of the models. GPT-3 learns context and associations from its training data, and so that training data included the internet, as well as Twitter, Reddit, and other social media. And we all know that those platforms do not always represent the best of humanity. So the results and outputs are reflective of embedded human values in the training data, for better or worse. As I said, GPT-3 training data includes the internet, so therefore people that contribute to the internet are contributing to the training data. And according to OpenAI, 93% of the training data used for GPT-3 is in English. Yet that does not at all reflect the distribution of the top five languages in the world by different ways of looking at those metrics. And of course, not everybody has access to the internet. Currently, only 50% of the global population has regular access to the internet. There are many factors that can limit internet accessibility, including financial, written literacy, digital literacy, remote or rural geolocation, accessibility, disability, and for those who are experiencing homelessness. So it's easy to see that even if you were to include the entire internet in all languages, many representations of humanity would still not be present in the resulting training data set. This is a problem because the AI model learns to reproduce values from the text that it is trained on. So there's been a lot of work into biased uh, representations in the training data of GPT-3. And I just want to call out this work published in Nature into the associations that GPT-3 makes between the word Muslim and the word violence. The author's test showed that GPT-3 associates the word Muslim with violent actions in 66% of the cases, as opposed to only 15% of the time for the word Christians. Uh, you can also see outputted word pairings there in, in the image B from their paper, 
which are highly problematic. How we relate words and language has as much to do with our socio-cultural experience as with the grammatical rules of the language we're using. Relationships between words are usually charged with values stored from relationships in our minds. And these relationships are often learned and reified by our environments, including our family constellations, community interactions, educational experiences, media consumptions, and social media usage. In an image search on Shutterstock for the word doctor, the first image that came up was this picture of a man. When I searched for a nurse, the first image that came up was a picture of a woman. So that's an example of embedded bias in the Shutterstock data set. There's these kinds of value sets that are seen by many as outdated that people are seeking to address in large language models. And this problem is called the value alignment problem. So when we decide to fix the value alignment problem and these toxic and inappropriate biases by choosing one value over the other, we quickly run into problems. Whose values are right? How can we maintain a diversity of value alignment? And how can we ensure minority voices are not drowned out in a stochastic democracy? There are three main areas being worked uh, of work being conducted right now to address these toxic outputs. All are important tools, but they all have some limitations. Our work best aligns with the fine tuning approach, a process that aims to adjust the weights of a model by providing a customized data set. Fine tuning uh, occurs when users upload curated pairings of prompts or, or those shots and completions or outputs to provide an additional layer of training to the model. But it requires technical expertise, human and financial resources, and has some other challenges as well. Nevertheless, we believe this is a good area for further development, and we see that our work uh, has been highly complementary to this approach. So, how do we frame the problem of value alignment in large language models, particularly GPT-3? Firstly, we don't believe it's a problem to be solved. This is not about good versus evil or right versus wrong. There are many conflicting values in the world. There are also some universal resonance of values. But additionally, the loudest voice should not always become the dominant voice. This led us to two research questions. One, how well does GPT-3 return the values contained in input texts in languages other than English? Spoiler alert, not very well. And the second one is, the question I'm most going to focus on today, what value conflicts arise between the input and output text? I don't want to go, this is our theoretical underpinnings of co-creation of language and value, as well as moral value pluralism. I'm not going to go into them too deeply, as I believe most people in this audience probably are already well across these ideas. But I do want to give you some highlights just to situate our work. So nations, whilst embodying many conflicting values at a granular individual and subgroup level, can often be depicted to hold some overarching values shared by the majority of people. For instance, the importance of individualism in the USA, the concept of mateship in Australia, and the emphasis on collective harmony in Asian countries. They're broad stroke pictures of very large groups of people that individually may hold numerous conflicting values. To be clear, we do not support the view that each country has a fixed monolithic national character, rather to recognize that on a statistical level, some values will be more represented than others in training data sets. So this image here is taken from the World Value Su Survey, which is used by the UN, UNESCO and the World Bank and some other large international organizations. And it's just one of the tools that we use um, in our work to look at different conflicts of values. This particular diagram is to give a top level view of what is a really very complex topic, value pluralism, and to show you where we stand as authors in this field. For instance, you can see that moral relativism here views that there are no wrong answers and absolutism that there is only one right answer. Then within value pluralism itself, we find two primary schools, political and moral value pluralism. And moral value pluralism, or MVP, recognizes that there are many diverse and irreducible values, ethics, and norms, though it does attest that there are some morals that are more rational than others. We believe that some universally resonant values are important in the 21st century. The idea that we can always live in harmonious pluralism when common ground cannot be found is difficult in our era of globalization and the fourth industrial revolution. When we are faced with vast global problems like climate change, pandemics, and food, food shortages, we need to include some resonance in our endeavors. So we each selected some texts from countries or cultures of our lived experience, as well as from the, the languages we speak. 
Uh, we selected texts that exhibited clear embedded values. And all texts that we selected were publicly available and often quite well known and previously studied. We ran these texts through two types of templates in GPT-3, both summarization templates, designed to reproduce the intent of the original text in the output text. So here's a little table giving you a top level overview of the, the texts and the tests that made it into the final paper. Uh, the tests were carried out in the virtual presence of all the authors so that the group could discuss together the results in real time and adjust accordingly. And this is a selection of texts that um, you can see that there are activist texts, classic philosophy, government documents and political speeches. And that put quite a variety of things there. So I'm just going to highlight three results in the interest of time. Um, the first one being gun control. So I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone here that statistically, the opinions towards gun ownership and control are different in Australia than they are in the USA. The USA has the highest level of civilian firearms per person in the world. And in fact, USA civilians make up 4% of the global population, but hold approximately 40% of the entire global stock of civilian firearms. Australian citizens own far fewer guns per person have shown statistically um, different attitudes to gun control. Uh, surveys that we've found indicate that 85% of Australians think that current gun controls are enough or should be increased, whereas nearly half of Americans indicate that it is more important to protect the right to own a gun than to control gun ownership. So as you can see here, the output from GPT-3 clearly um, parrots a US-centric value when it comes to gun control. The next example I'm going to show you is when we fed in a um, speech from Angela Merkel in 2016 on refugee immigration that supported the open door policy of Germany at the time. Uh, GPT-3 returned a highly conflicted value, as you can see. Uh, the model, the training class of the model, I told you we only had one training class of this model, happened at the end of 2019 when Donald Trump was still in power in the US. And as you all know, Trump had been leading the discourse on anti-refugee immigration for several years. This discourse was embedded into some of the contributions of the internet by US Trump supporters. So those patterns were in there for GPT-3 to find. Trump supporters, which at the time of his election were more than half of the voting public of the USA, would have reiterated these sentiments in social media sites and video streaming comments. The third example I'm going to give you is uh, we fed in a French government text on secularism. Uh, the GPT-3 output indicates that French secularism is seen as uh, illiberal and anti-democratic. Uh, as the French government goes so far as to ban the Muslim veil in schools, GPT-3 output becomes an anti-Muslim manifesto, which is the exact opposite intent of the original text. So these three examples, and we have quite a few more, show that you know, we have an often said conflict of values of going in and then what's coming out. Right, so now we know that we've got fragmented values and stochastic decisions to look at. So how are we going to address these value conflicts in large language models or LLMs? It's challenging for any LLM proposed for use on a global scale to align with the multiplicity of social and cultural customs and norms that influence how these technologies are developed and used. In a world where we respectfully acknowledge that often two conflicting cultural viewpoints are both valid and deserving of representation, we must be vigilant to the dangers of powerful new technologies reifying traditional dominant standpoints. We're at a crossroads of the nascent uh, AI technology, and we're hardwiring values and standpoints into these models that may lead to strengthening outdated values such as racism, misogyny, and other forms of prejudice. So our aim was to address these concerns. We sought to develop some work that might help with that challenge. And we've created a guideline to map conflicting values with the intent that it could be used for fine tuning data sets in future large language models. When we looked into the literature on value pluralism, we ended up selecting Thomas Nagel's categories of value as a good starting point. Who needs to reinvent the wheel? Um, and we can see from value categories one to five that many texts that you would come up with could be categorized into those. Our texts are generally in the first, second and third categories because they're usually political or ideological in nature. We've added a sixth uh, value category uh, in accordance with our belief of globally resonant values and we believe that reflects values that are aligned with global interests. So if we were to apply this to our Australian firearms 
control test, then we see that the input category uh, value of three, utility, so, you know, control guns to ensure public safety, the effects of what one does on, everyone, on everyone's welfare. And then the output category from GPT-3 is category value two. So it's about rights, rights to liberty of certain kinds. So clearly we see conflict of values. Nagel also made a distinction between value conflicts, contingent and non-contingent. And he classifies non-contingent value conflict in weaker and stronger forms. Weaker means incompatibility, impossibility, in principle of realizing one value while realizing the other value or without frustrating the other. And a stronger sense that values oppose and condemn each other. For example, one can't have freedom of speech and prohibit protesting. So if we put all this together, then we see this. We've got the Australian Firearms Act. Input category value three, utility output value category two, rights, type of conflict, non-contingent conflict, strong sense. So we believe that developing this mapping exercise into a framework that uh, you know, people that use uh, large language models could use would help them more clearly see the embedded conflicts and ensure that the model is tuned to choose the value that they are aligned with. In summary, when there is a conflict of values between the input and the output text, we found that the output text was more often aligned with reported values of the USA, according to the World Value Survey and to some other statistical data sets. We applied Nagel's fragmentation of values and classification of conflicts to the resulting conflicts. And we believe that this mapping exercise would be useful for fine tuning newer large language models. We believe this is only the very beginning of potential research into using value pluralism to address value alignment problems with large language models. More targeted tests, as well as tests addressing global resonant values, should provide more guidance to users of LLMs. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>